Hi, Internet. It's Emily SW. Sam. We're here with the podcastle, episode number, whatever number. I think this is eight. Mm, good number, good number. I love the number eight. Fun fact about me. Favorite number. Uh, anyways, we're here with H.G. <laughs> Wells' War of the Worlds. And we've been on a journey with this story. <laughs> We've probably spent more time with this particular story than any other story thus far. Aside from Dracula. Well, we didn't do a podcast about Dracula. That's true, we haven't done a podcast about Dracula. We do talk about Dracula a lot. Listen, I just think about vampires. Yes. All the time. Yes, that's true. Not Dracula vampires, different vampires. In general. But that's a different topic. Different different topic, (laughs) different topic. I was going to say, mm-hmm. it's not because this novel is particularly long, Mm-mm. but because this novel has the most adaptations out of everything we've talked about so far. Yes, and there are, a lot of them are very influential adaptations. I mean, the book itself was influential. Clearly, by the number of adaptations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and H.G. Wells is credited as the father of science fiction. So, yeah, we, we read the story, obviously, which... We'll get into that in a little bit, but we read the book, and we, we've we both listened to the radio play, the famous uh, radio play with, a, uh, I was going to say H.G. Wells, <laughs> Orson Wells, different Wells. Yes. Uh, we watched the 1953 movie. Correct. We watched the 2005 Tom Cruise movie, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> and... I watched the first episode of a recent War of the Worlds TV series. I only watched the first episode. Spoiler alert, I wasn't a huge fan of it, so I didn't watch the rest of it. Um, But yeah, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about this story, talking about it, consuming media about it. And it turns out, we read two different versions. Surprise! (laughs) So I have a copy. It's the Collector's Book of Science Fiction the copyright date in it is 1978. This actually belongs to my father. Mm-hmm. But it is a collection that presents the story as they appeared in the original serialized version in Pearson's magazine, mostly. With the original illustrations. It is very cool. It, yeah, it's it's very aesthetic. Mm-hmm. It's basically just they took the magazine pages and put it into a book. Yeah, yeah, and the illustrations are really cool. Um, You can probably look them up online if you don't exactly have this copy. My copy I got from the library, just a H.G. Wells kind of classic compilation, so it has The War of the Worlds, The Invisible Man, First Men on the Moon, and The Time Machine. And uh, this must have been... And now I can't find any information about the exact edition that I have, which is kind of annoying. I have, it's a modern reprinting. It's a World Classics Library. Yeah, so World Classics Library, it was published in 2020. So a recent published edition. It doesn't have the original copyright date of the story, which sometimes these do. In the introduction, it doesn't mention using an edited version or a later version or anything like that. But we've discovered that we must have read different versions because I was telling Sam all about this quote that I really liked, and Sam was like, I don't have that. (laughs) Yeah, you were reading it, and I was thinking, this doesn't sound familiar at all. And I was like, did I completely forget about portions of the text? But it turns out, because I said, well, where is that? And they told me whereabouts which chapter it was in, and I'm looking, I'm flipping through the pages, like, in this chapter, i like, I don't see it. Yeah. And then you figured out, because it's not in here. No. Yeah, so we were able to match up the paragraph before it and some of the paragraphs after it, which is how we discovered the one that I was quoting was not in Sam's edition. <laughs> so, very clearly, I have an edited version, which, if you know, when you take a serial, serialized story and put it into a novel, it makes sense you would make some changes. It needs to flow differently as a novel than it did as a serial, but it's not noted anywhere. And I, I searched on the internet, and I tried multiple different keywords, War of the Worlds editions, War of the Worlds Pearson's edition, War of the Worlds different text, edited text. I couldn't find any information about it, but it must have been edited. (laughs) Kind of annoying that I couldn't verify it, but also, why am I trying to verify it? We literally verified it with our (laughs) eyeballs. (laughs) I'm just curious now, what else was added to the later editions that's not in the original magazine version? I know, it's kind of a shame we didn't discover this until just as we were sitting down to record. (laughs) 
Because we try not to talk about these things too much before the podcast, so we don't say everything good and then forget it. While we had talked about it a little bit, it wasn't anything in depth like this. And so <laughs> we missed an opportunity. But again, we've spent so much time in this story, like... We've immersed ourselves. Yeah, well, even when you came over a couple weeks ago, I was like, oh, I have all these thoughts, mm-hmm. I have all these things. I was like, I need to save it, because if I tell it all to you now, then it won't, like, still be stored in my brain anymore. Yeah, well, and of course, it'll come out perfectly the first time, and then... And then when I we try to record yeah. this, then I, I won't remember, I won't know how to articulate anymore what I wanted to say. Yeah, so we've, um, so that was a bit of a surprise today when we sat down to record. That we both read different versions. But obviously the story is the same. It's just I had some extra Probably stuff. Probably fluff, mostly. Right? Yeah, I mean, the paragraph I was reading you was just the narrator kind of pontificating. So I, I bet it's mostly just H.G. Wells going, okay, I want to hammer a couple of points home, so let me just add some stuff, just in case anyone missed it. Where should we begin our discussion discussion? You know what I wanted to touch on quickly was about H.G. Wells being the father of science fiction. Mm-hmm. Wasn't Jules Verne older? Yes, Jules Verne came first, and also Mary Shelley came first. Well, Mary Shelley wouldn't be the father of no, science No, she's fiction. the mother of science. I- I'm sorry, I just looked up Jules Verne, and the the first suggestion is a Wikipedia article about Yule, which has... <laughs> I'm not... Like, everything underneath that is Jules Verne, but why is that... That is intr- Yule. <laughs> Jules Verne was born in 1828 and died in 1905. So he did come before H.G. Wells, because this was published. War of the Worlds was published in 1898, so he would have been publishing for that. Because Jules Verne's also a science fiction author. He is. People like to compare them a lot, but I don't really think they're comparable. Jules Verne wrote technology-based adventure stories. Yeah. H.G. Wells wrote creature-based, almost science fiction horror Yes. Yes, there's a lot of horror elements in War of the Worlds. Well, it was the last thing I read Dr. Moreau experimenting with different kinds of life forms, the Invisible Man experimenting, changing, altering mm-hmm. life itself. Do most of H.G. Wells' stories have horror elements in them? There's a lot of body horror. The Invisible Man was turned into a horror movie. I would say Dr. Moreau, horror. Oh, absolutely horror. There, Yeah, and there's no way in hell that's not horror. War of the Worlds can be horror. Even there's another story in here that I read. It's called The Flowering of the Strange Orchid. It's about a orchid that when it blooms, it, you know, grows tendrils and sucks the blood out of people. That's a common theme with him. We'll get into it, but... Tendrils. Some... Tendrils and, and blood, blood sucking. <laughs> We're back to them. We are. You know what? <laughs> Everything comes back to vampires. That's the whole point of this channel. Vampires? Mm-hmm. This is the secret vampire agenda. Yes. It's it's in everything we do. It's the subtext. But anyway, that's why we're talking about H.G. Wells on the Gothic Literature Podcast. Because I, I think it's sci-fi horror. It's absolutely sci-fi horror. And also, it's our channel. We can do whatever the hell we want. That's right. I heartily enjoy reading H.G. Wells. I've, I've, um... Jules Verne and I... Mm, Jules Verne is very technical. He's very de- technical, and um, I tried to read Journey to the Center of the Earth. I gave up on it because I was, this is, I just, I like threw the copy. I was like, this is ridiculous. I didn't throw it. It was a library book. But I metaphorically threw it down. I was like, I'm, I'm done with this. This is ridiculous. I, I just did reached I a point. Read, I, I did not read Journey to the Center of the Earth. I did read 20,000 Leagues mm. Under the Sea, which involved me skipping over pages of descriptions about fish. And I also read, was it Mysterious Island? I think so. Where they get uh, blown off, they get blown across the entirety of the United States on their hot air balloon. Oh, that's right, you told me about that. I, yes, <laughs> I remember you telling me about this. I did read that one. There is also a film adaptation of that, which does not resemble the novel. The only thing that's similar is that there's an island, a hot air balloon, and they're stranded. That's it. Those okay. are the, that's the end of the similarities. Yeah. That one did not have as much descriptions about fish in it. At See, least I remember being a little more engaged with that one. I might like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea because I like fish in the ocean. So I might maybe, enjoy... Maybe you will. Journey to the Center of the Earth I gave up on because they were trapped deep in um, a volcano with no light. And at one point... And it was just endless descriptions of being trapped in this 
cave thing with no light. And I was like, I get it. It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, they get separated. And one of the characters loses his absolute mind, starts running, bashes his head into the wall, and falls unconscious. And at that point, I shut the book. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> That's fair. Well, I also read that Master of the World book, which was technology. Mm -hmm. Lots of vehicles. Yeah, so maybe I'll try 20,000 Leagues then. Anyways. I have to say, with this story, I started reading it. And first you get the whole backstory about the Martians and how they're looking for another planet. You get a charming sense of this narrator, this very charming British countryman. So it kind of lulls you in a little bit because it starts off slow. It did start off a little slow. And I do I do think it's interesting how basically every film adaptation keeps this like opening narration bit. Especially that no one would have believed in the last years of the 19th mm -hmm. century, in the early years of the 21st century, whatever the setting of the movie is, they keep this almost verbatim, this opening paragraph. Paragraph. Yeah, it's it's almost like they they keep that in to be an you know, homage to the narrative nature of the first of you the know original what? work. He also foreshadows. So in the two thousand five film, we we actually opened coming out of that drop of water. Mm, yeah, there was a close up of like Jeremy's. And the opening paragraph talks about the affairs of of men were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as closely as man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply. In a drop of water. Also foreshadowing by yes. the end. Yes, yes. But it talks about space. Yeah, I um, I actually, I got so engrossed in the opening narration of this book that I forgot to be, like, keep making tabs. So I didn't make any sort of mental notes for the first 30 pages or so because I was just in it. Highly recommend this book, by the way. Whichever edition you can get your hand on. Yeah, and then when the, the first Martian, they don't know they're Martians yet, but when mm -hmm. the first... Hits the earth. It gets very exciting. It does. And we have... Now this, uh, we can talk about one of the vital parts of this story that is not universally in every single adaptation of this, is the part where it's slow. It crashes into earth, nobody knows what's going on, and human beings are curious creatures. So there's this kind of flock of sightseers, everyone's trying to figure out what it is. There's... It gets to the point... In the original novel where there's people selling snacks. I think there's like a boy with apples or something. A guy with a cart who's got food. Sightseers. People on bikes. And we see this in the 1953 movie. Now that's set in America. And it's not in the Victorian era uh, period. So... No, it's contemporary. It's contemporary to the time that the movie was shot. So you get, you get a bunch of sightseers. You get somebody selling popcorn. You get a mother taking a picture of her children in front of this big thing. Yeah, the crater. With the, the crater. Space rock. Mm-hmm. And you do get you do get some of that in the two thousand five Tom Cruise movie where people are taking pictures and crowding around and oh my god, what is it? Yeah, it doesn't it's last, not slow though. That doesn't last very long. No, you get like two seconds of that. Um now the T V show, the first episode of the T V show I watched, I was disappointed immediately because it skipped this part. It skipped the part like everything crashes and instead of the portrayal of kind of curious human nature. And then again, in the book, you have characters who are, like, trying to communicate, wave white flags, trying to see, you know, be friendly with whatever it is in the crater, in the, the big tube. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting commentary about human nature. Yeah, because, and it's important to the story. <laughs> because the humans first approach this thing in the novel and also the 50s, Mm -hmm. film. And also in the 1996 film Independence Day. Oh, I forgot about it. I forgot to bring up Independence Day. <laughs> which best adaptation which is, I mean, it's called like an homage, right? But it hits all the plot beats. It hits all the major of important the world. Yeah. yeah. It's basically an adaptation. People approach the alien thing in good faith. Yes, and this is missing from that TV show adaptation I watched. It wasn't the BBC version. It was on MGM. But um, it, they did not... There was none of that good faith stuff. It was just it landed, and there was like, oh my god, what is it? And then it was immediately just, kill it. It's dangerous. Kill it. Get away from it. So it totally took that element out, which really, for me, I think that's such an important element of the story and kind of the point of H.G. Wells writing the story in the first place. Mm -hmm. That exploration of human nature. So that just totally killed that adaptation for me. 
personally. But the Tom Cruise version just wasn't very good, in my opinion. Like, one of the things that was missing for the, the reveal of the aliens and what actually, because it comes out of the ground there, there's all these lightning strikes and there's a hole in the ground and the, the ship rises from the ground. In the original one, there's, like, a meteor and they can hear noises from the inside and then it, it starts unscrewing. And there's a long period of what is it? Yes. What's happening? We hear something in there. Is there something alive inside there? And then in the novel, they try to, they think, first they think there's people inside this rock and they try to get help and they want to rescue us, mm-hmm. you know, rescue the, the men inside. But in the 2005 film, there's the storm and everyone's kind of gawking at it, but then it turns violent almost right away like they're frightened yes of the lightning so we already are told this is something to fear before we even see the aliens yeah there's no ambiguity there and then he walks out and all the cars have stopped from the emp and they go and there's a hole in the ground and then causes the cracks and the the destruction because it's a steven spielberg movie everything crumbles and it rises from so we don't have any sense of like there's curiosity there's no sense of but wonder there's no good faith curiosity no no it's more of the kind of rubberneck sort of thing where you know when there's an accident on the throughway it's likely to cause more accidents because people are just want to see what you know mm-hmm. it's more of a morbid curiosity than a oh oh gee golly we've got neighbors from space yeah so then when the aliens do bust out their heat rays and start vaporizing people, you don't have that same kind of, like, gut punch because no. we've already established that this is frightening. Does that yeah. make sense? No, it does make sense. We've already established uh, we're in an action horror movie. And like you said, the cracks appear before the alien does, so it's already destroying things. Whereas in the book, I mean, yeah, it sets some trees on fire, but it's in, like, a field. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't hurt anybody when it lands. We are also given some necessary background information because they communicate with, like, astronomers and the narrator of the story. The narrator's never named Mm -mm. in the novel. It's just a guy. Very few people are named in that story at all. It's just, the narrator is just a first person. It's his brother, his wife, curate. There's the soldier guy, which I forget what he calls him. He might have called him an artilleryman because there was a lot, yes... The artillerymen. There was a lot of mention of artillery when the military actually starts going up there. Really, the only characters that really get named in this are the three that die. The peace convoy. And the two women. And the two women. That the narrator's brother kind of helps and rescues. That's it. Nobody else gets a name. It's just titles. I mean, obviously, in in a, in a movie, you kind of need to give them names. Like, I get that. But I think... It's important for the way Wells tells this story because it really does make his kind of points about humanity broader, right? Like, they don't have any names in there. It could literally be anybody. It's you and your brother. Because Wells, I mean, obviously we don't know what he was thinking, but we do know what he was trying to do with this story because he said it. And he was making a commentary on humanity and also the things that humanity does to each other. In particular, imperialism. British imperialism. Yes, let me see if I can find that passage specifically. It was near the beginning, wasn't it? We've uncovered another interesting difference between our editions. Yeah, so you were saying colonialism, imperialism. Yes. The um, the point of the War of the Worlds, and you can read this in the text of the story. You don't need to know this, but also Issue Wells himself said that I am anti-British imperialism. This is why I wrote this book. And But again, you really if you read this story and you're just slightly paying attention, it, it comes across. Yeah, For so example. The paragraph that we are referring to specifically says, And before we judge of them too harshly in their invasion, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has brought not only upon animals such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its own own inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. 
I do have to say, though, we would not word it as an inferior race. No. H.G. Wells was, for all the message saying that what the Martians are about to do to the English, Mm -hmm. the English, or the Europeans more broadly, did to other people. But he still makes a point, or he still calls them inferior. Yes. Or in spite of their human likeness. Human likeness. They're not, they're not human completely. Yeah. They're like humans. Yeah. But not quite. He did this in Dr. Moreau, too, where he compared some of, like, the animal people to different races. Yeah, so, still racist. Ahead of the curve in that he's like, guys, we shouldn't do this whole colonialism thing, but still behind the curve on other things. Yeah. It's almost like he's saying, you know, people who aren't exactly like us still deserve to live, Mm. but they're still not like us. Yes. He is still highlighting the difference. Mm -hmm. But um, we discovered in finding this exact quote that our editions differ. Not a whole lot. I still have this paragraph. It's just phrased like slightly differently. And the last sentence is different. Is the biggest difference because my in mine the last sentence is are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? Mine says, Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians turned against us? It's interesting noting these changes. Your copy also took the word own out of its own inferior races. Yes, it did. I think that word is necessary here. It is. It is. I think you can take out inferior. <laughs> mm-hmm. You should take out inferior, uh, but upon its own races. There, we've got it. <laughs> yes, yes. That would be the point of it. That omission there others them even more yep. than the original text did, saying, well, they still belong to us, even though they're not as good as us. But your version is, is basically saying they don't belong to us at all. No, it's lumping them more with the bison and the dodo than with human beings. Right. Yes. But they don't deserve to be exterminated. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. That's, <laughs> let's focus on that. This podcast is not here to discuss racism in Victorian texts. I'm sure there are some other interesting books and articles that you could find by oh, people more qualified yes. to speak on such issues than us. Anti-imperialist. This, is, this entire thing is a commentary on imperialism and humanity. And that's why the Martians land in England. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sun never sets on the British Empire. I also thought it was really funny because the brother and the two women that he helps, they get at one point they get on a ship to mm-hmm. go across the channel to France. Yes. With the implication that there's nothing going on in France. The entire French government is kind of just like, well, you can send your refugees, yeah. but that's a you problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're having Good to- luck. Yeah. <laughs> bon chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh boy, you got some problems over there, huh? Keep them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. The invasion never extends outside of the British Isles. <laughs> Yeah, which is something I think every adaptation differs in. Like, the 1953 movie, it mentions other governments dealing with this stuff. Independence Day, all over the world. 2005 movie, it's all over the world. So Yeah, we're told. We're not shown anything no, we're not in shown, that movie. No. We're told a lot of things. In that sense, I think... Well, H.G. Wells with this story was very, very specifically, specifically targeting British problems, right? Yes. Uh, so that kind of makes sense from his narrative standpoint. From a broader narrative standpoint, it makes sense to apply it to the entire... Like, if Mars is trying to take over the entire planet, they probably would focus on not just England. <laughs> not just one you know, tiny island. You know what it's like? <laughs> it's like an anime. <laughs> Continue. Where there's villains, but they're only in Japan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the Sailor Moon villains who want to steal all the Earthlings' energy and mm-hmm. take over the Earth, if they left Tokyo, Sailor Moon would not go after them. No, she's too busy going to school. They only ever confront Sailor Moon because they always, very by happy coincidence, are in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, really, when you think about Sailor Moon too hard, it does kind of fall apart a little bit. But that's also, I think, effective in the book narrative. Not Sailor Moon. I mean, <laughs> that sentence wasn't constructed very well. Having the focus be on England 
when you're reading it, it doesn't really matter because the narration is so close. You are either with the narrator on the ground experiencing horrors or the brother on the ground experiencing, trying to escape horrors. Experiencing different horrors. Yes, he so, did. You know. He did. So there was the two women. And there was the one who was named quite a bit. And then there was her sister-in-law. Yes. But they were trying to escape London. And they end up on a completely overcrowded, congested road where people are really just hashing it out. You see this scene in every adaptation that we've watched of people trying to escape the monsters and thus becoming monsters themselves. Pushing each other, people getting trampled in the Tom Cruise 2005 movie, people get shot over the car and there's violence and despair. Yeah, well, I mean, someone tries to steal their pony or something at one point and this woman just whips out a pistol. She knows what's up. Yeah. She's she's true heroine. I had a lot of thoughts about this scene because it is quite harrowing. It is. It, it, it's described as horrible. It is also one of the most action-packed sequences. Because there is a lot of horror in this story in that we spend a lot of time trying to avoid action scenes, essentially, to survive. But this is very action-y and very jarring. I was thinking a lot because I think one of the big debates people have is you have books and movies portraying a complete, like, not even just like a collapse of society, but it collapses into chaos and violence. Yes. But then you also have people where they know people would come together and they would help each other. And you see both these things happen in like natural disasters. Yes. And stuff. Would a stampede of people trying to escape a city actually happen that way? Mm. Maybe not. I mean, I think... What we saw in the 50s movie, where the initial evacuation is very orderly and peaceful, and then you have, like, the stragglers as people get more desperate. Yes. That's when it starts to fall apart. Yeah, I think that makes more sense. And and I also think, in the story, you have the portrayal of both, right? You have the portrayal of people helping each other immediately, directly juxtaposed with people trying to kill each other, essentially. Because you have... The narrator's brother who is helping these women. But he's like, I'm a good guy. I'm going to help you. And and it's immediately, they're just trying to get through this sea of people who are trampling each other. There's a man who gets trampled in the street and he, he drops all his money. And so the brother is like, wait, let me help you. And he's like, no, don't help me. Get away from my money. That scene really stood out to me because I think a lot of things were happening in that scene. There were, but there was also a really unfortunate detail about that character. Going back to stereotypes. Yeah, where he was referred to as the Jew. Yes. And I'm thinking about it as, like, the fact I still understand he was trying to give us the character of someone who is kind of, like, stingy and money-centric and greedy, Mm -hmm. kind of, values money above his own life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Mm." the fact that I understand why he chose a Jewish person to portray this stereotype is not great. <laughs> it, it really does draw on a long history of anti-Semitic mm-hmm. stereotypes. Yeah. Because we can look at that and go, like, this is a bad depiction. It takes you out of that scene. It does. Yeah, it does. It's such a shame because he really, he doesn't have to be Jewish. No, he could just be a guy. He could just be he a guy. Could be, he could be, it would have been... you know, a greedy business owner or something. He could have been anybody. Especially because, in particular in the brothers' parts, they do talk a lot about how, you know, capitalism starts ramping up, you know, all this, before we get to this scene, before he leaves London, and before everyone really knows, oh man, our goose is cooked, he talks about the paper boys, where the paper, the people printing the papers keep charging more money, because it's the only way people can get their information. So the price gets jacked way up. He is purposefully making these commentaries on human greed mm-hmm. and preying on destruction. But he, like, he didn't, he didn't need to use the stereotype. <laughs> like it, it would have been more effective if it was just, like you said, a business owner, like a lord. We're in England. There's lords, right? Yeah, yeah. I forgot. I forgot about that. <laughs> We have a social hierarchy Mm -hmm. based on aristocracy. (laughs) Yeah, like, make it a member of the aristocracy. It could have been someone from Parliament. (laughs) Yeah, especially since it was in London. (laughs) He does not mention the government, like, at all. No, it's very briefly mentioned, I think. And I don't remember if 
it comes up in the brother's narration or if it's like some information the narrator gets from one of the soldier people. But there is some mention of Parliament. Oh, I think it is in the brothers thing because Parliament, like the government's trying to figure out what to do. Theoretically, they also flee when, yes. especially because of the black smoke. Ooh, yes, the, the black smoke, which does not appear in any of the adaptations that we've not seen. Not that we've seen. No. Ag- and again, I only watched the first episode of that TV show. The Martians actually have two weapons. Yes, they have the, the heat ray and black smoke, which is poison. Yeah, it's a biological weapon. They use both of these quite effectively. I think it's described where the smoke's like rolling through towns and cities and mm-hmm. just wiping out people en masse. Yeah, well, he basically describes it as, like, a dense, like, a heavy fog. Already, I think on a certain level, human beings are kind of afraid of fog because you can't see anything. It comes up out of nowhere, right? Like, fog is used in a lot of horror things. It's a very effective means of it deadens sound. Anything could happen in the fog. So now you have this black fog that will literally kill you. Literally, it's a biological agent that kills yeah. living things. It had some weird qualities. Like, it would eventually become... Like, it would settle... It was so heavy, yeah. Like a dust. So it's almost just like a noxious dust cloud. Yeah. That, you know, gets kicked up, and, and then it eventually settles down as dust. Yeah, and then, like, as the dust, it's fine, I guess. Because then our narrator comes through these places that have had the black fog come through, and he describes them as being covered in black dust, but he's fine. He can walk through it, but he's not breathing it because he does describe it as being so heavy that once it sinks, like, it's that's it, it's done. And then, like, when it gets in the water, it, like, sinks into the water, and then he mentioned that, but it didn't come up again. Whatever. No, I guess you can see why they don't put it into many adaptations, because first of all, they usually make the Martians so powerful. Yeah. Do we really need this as well? Probably because it's easier to show. And I know for the first adaptation in the 50s, they gave the Martians some extra technology in force field shields. Mm -hmm. And they did that because the reasoning was that the military weapons were powerful enough they would have just blown them off the back off the face of the earth, right? Yes, because this this was very shortly after... World War Two and nuclear weapons came about. And they did, in fact, use a nuclear weapon. Um, Bounced right off that shield. Yeah, so that was the reasoning. That, well, we've got nukes, so we can't just have the Martians not be able to stand up to that because it defeats the whole purpose of the story. Yeah, because in the in the book, you, you get a lot, not a lot, but you get a fair amount of description, these military battles. Like, it is a war. There is actual fighting, and it's not just, com- it's still totally unbalanced. The military gets its butt kicked. Yes. But it's not just the Martians set off their heat weight ray and destroy anything, and there's nothing the military can do. The military, we see on page them destroy at least, I think, three of the tripod machines. Yeah, you have the one the narrator witnesses, because uh, what happens is the artillery shells, they don't really damage them, it just pings off the metal. But one of the artillery directly hits one, and that damages it and explodes, and that is how they get one of them down. Yeah, except then it was activating its heat ray at the same time, and then the heat ray machine falls into the water and boils the water with all the refugees in it. Yeah, so basically, kind of like death throws. It could be killed, but first of all, it came at a high price. The other ones get killed in naval warfare. (laughs) Yes, the Thunder Child, which I think is one of the best scenes in the entire It is, but you understood this better than me because... I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I don't care if I look kind of stupid. I was picturing a submarine. It's not a submarine. No. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about ships of the time period, especially military ships. I know a little bit about ships that came after because I like to read about naval disasters, but I didn't know what it was, so I was picturing a submarine. But it's not. It was a... What is it? A torpedo ship? It's a ram. Mm. A torpedo ram is a type of torpedo boat combining a ram with torpedo tubes. Designed for coastal defense, low profile and high speed. If you also Google Thunderchild, it'll tell you. Oh, okay. That was a real... Th- no, it's not. But it's famous enough from this story that it'll come up. Thunderchild. Thunderchild World Church. <laughs> HMS Thunderchild. Ironclad torpedo ram of the Royal Navy based on the HMS Polyphemus. Oh, yeah which was the sole torpedo ram to sea service with the Royal Navy from 1881 to 1903. Okay, so the ship, the Thunderchild, is a torpedo ram. And it was noticeable because, what you just read, the Navy only ever used one of them. (laughs) 
Yeah. So it's not like a super famous or well-known ship. I think probably the fictional one is more famous than the real one. Well, and clearly, I had no concept of what it was, so I was picturing something well, completely What wrong. I was imagining was illustrated on the cover of this book. Mm, yeah. I, I had a bit of an advantage because the dust jacket for this book depicts a ship being attacked by the heat ray of the Martian tripod. Yeah, mine doesn't have illustrations. It just has an astronaut on the cover. And you can see the crew jumping off the back. But anyways, his brother is on this ship as a refugee and they're trying to get across the channel and they're being attacked by the Martian tripods and then this ironclad torpedo ram comes in to save the day and even though the torpedo ram is hit, it rams itself mm-hmm. into the tripod and destroys one. Yeah, I think it takes down two. Uh, there it? was at least two uh, in the two, total maybe of three, this battle. Yeah. That torpedo ram really is the hero. Pretty significant victories here, which I do think is important to the story because it's showing that the Martians can be killed. It's in difficult. They are incredibly advanced, but they are, at the end of the day, flesh and blood creatures. They can be defeated. Yeah, so they actually they shoot one down. And then they're hit by another um, heat ray, and then as their ship is sinking, they ram themselves into a, uh, a second one. Oh, okay, okay. And then his brother escapes, and that's the last we hear of him <laughs> in the story. <laughs> yeah, it really... <laughs> like, I understand for the purpose of the story, but I-, I love a reunion, you know? Like, we get a reunion with the narrator and his wife, but we don't get, like, the brother... We can safely assume that the narrator and his brother meet again because the narrator is telling us his brother's story. Yes. Like, he's, it, we don't shift point of view here because he says, my brother mm-hmm. did this, my brother did that. So his brother has to relate this yeah. story to him at some point. But I just, I thought it was so funny. After he gets done telling his brother's story, the next chapter is like, my inexperience or inexpertness as a story writer insists on appearing. I have wandered away from my own adventures to tell the experience of my brother. And he just goes on to like this whole thing about how he's not a good writer, Mm -hmm. which is really funny to me because this is written by a good writer. Yeah. (laughs) It is a published work of fiction that has endured the test of time. If he was a romance writer, he would have had his brother marry the lady. See, that's not in my version. In the version I read, it says, I've wandered so much from my own adventures to tell the exper- of the experiences of my brother. That's not how this one starts at all. No, mine just goes straight to, I wandered away from my own adventures... All through the last two chapters, I and the curate have been lurking in the empty house at Halliford, where we went to escape the black... Whither we fled to escape the black smoke. There I will resume. There's none of that other stuff. Yeah, well, this says this, and then it says about this whole thing about... You know, if I were a romance writer, I would have totally written a romance there. He keeps going. I know it would have been more picturesque if I could have told of the two standing side by side on the steamer, hand in hand, she with shining eyes and parted lips, watching that wonderful fight. I could imagine her grip tightening. I could imagine her enthusiasm rising, for she is not the type to be cowed by danger. And my brother's attention divided between her beauty and the war. But the truth is the truth, and when the time came for us to meet again, I asked my brother how she faced that last strange spectacle, hoping to find a touch of true romantic color. And he answered prosaically, I don't know, I didn't notice her. She was forward, I think, in the empty part of the boat, attending to Mrs. Elphinstone, who was hysterical. I'd offered to help, but I didn't see anything that I could do, so I went aft to watch the fight. So poor romance, with its craving for situation, goes down under the pitiless heels of fact. Damn. <laughs> Boy, there, there's even some stuff to unpack there. So Why did he cut that out? I don't know. <laughs> That's like the best part. <laughs> Yeah, he really was like, ah. The funniest part about that to me is that it's so meta. Like, that's why (laughs) it's funny. Because it's like, I could have put this romance in. It's like, yeah, you could (laughs) have. What's stopping you? (laughs) It's like he's talking to himself. (laughs) But uh, confirmed, he and his brother do, in fact, meet again. (laughs) Yeah, see, that was missing from mine. I just, it just cuts straight from the brother's narration back to him and the curate. And I'm like... (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I had the addition of the paragraph that we'll get to in a little bit. <laughs> you had the- At the subtraction of that. Man. <laughs> We're piecing this together. We're piecing this together as we Together go. we will have the whole story. I had a, another thought. on the, so, so Mrs. Elphinstone, 
like the one named character in the entire story. Mm-hmm. Her sister-in-law, Miss Elphinstone, who's her husband's sister. You have Mrs. Elphinstone, who's, as we are told here, hysterical mm-hmm. through most of it. Miss Elphinstone, and then the narrator's wife, is not in the story much. Mm-mm. But when she is in the story, what really struck me was when, in the beginning, when the Martians come, their chimney gets destroyed by a heat ray. And he goes to the local pub to ask the keeper there for his dog cart. Yes. Which was totally misleading, because you don't drive them with dogs. No. You still I, need a horse. You still need a horse. I assumed it was just a small cart. I used my context clues for that one. Yes. Um, I don't know why it's called a dog cart, though. Because, you, know, you know, also, being a North American, I was thinking, thinking like, you know, the oh, call like a, of the wild. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like a dog sled. But yeah, dog sled. That's it. Oh, no, that's not, not correct at all. And then he drives her to her cousin's mm-hmm. place where she stays. And he basically says she just watches behind as this horror is unfolding and she's speechless. Silent. Which was a really refreshingly realistic portrayal of a terrified woman. Yeah, not shrieking, mm-hmm. not whimpering, not... We do, in the 1950s movie, uh, she does whimper a little bit. And shriek. And shriek. So I appreciated that. Like, this, you know, this is a realistic depiction of someone who's horrified. Yes, trauma. There, There is definitely some real trauma, and that was one thing... I didn't write this down in my notes, but there is talk of PTSD in this. Like, real yes. PTSD. Which is wild, because this is this was written before World War One. So, and even in World War One, like, that's kind of where it became prevalent, right? Shell shock. But it was still... It took World War II mm-hmm. for actual, like, psychiatric... Diagnosis? Not diagnosis. When things are made uniform and given criteria and... Oh, evaluation? Research? Credibility? <laughs> no, like, uh, when there's a standard for something. Parameters? Symptoms? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The DSM-1 was written after World War II. Oh, the so, manual. The manual, yes. So we have a uniform criteria diagnosis. for diagnosing yeah, 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 yeah. mental health disorders. But yeah, but and I thought his portrayals of trauma in this book were far and ahead of their time because even in World War II, like, PTSD sh- shell shock, it was kind of looked down on. It was like, oh, you just don't want to fight. Mm-hmm. You're a coward. So I thought his portrayals of different types of trauma were very good and compassionate and real, I think. Granted, I've never been in a war, so I can't say for sure. But from what I've read about PTSD and what I've seen in other media, it seemed pretty accurate to me. And I just thought that was notable. That lends credibility to his entire exploration of humanity because... He has so many different portrayals. Like, each character is a different aspect of humanity, or a different kind of path you can take when humanity takes when faced with such things, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you've got the artillery man, who, first of all, he's a soldier, so Mm -hmm. fighting, first and foremost. And then later on, when we meet him again, he becomes kind of obsessed with this idea of propagating the race. Going underground... We're not going to fight them. We can't fight them. What we got to do is we got to go underground. We got to rebuild society underground and then do this thing. And so that then becomes his purpose. So there's that. And then you, you've got the curate, religion, God. That one's easy. That metaphor is easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's also another one that's portrayed in most adaptations where you have mm-hmm. the guy, the end is here. It's the apocalypse. Yes. Like, that's that character. Yeah. You, so you've got that. Uh, the narrator kind of goes through a, a plethora of things. He experiences blanket horror and terror and shock. He also experiences... He goes through these changes as a person where... He, growth is not the right word, but like when him and the curate are trapped in the house by the Martians. And the curate starts losing his mind. And the curate goes animalistic. right? He wants to eat all the food right away. He's not thinking rationally. He's been reduced to an animal. He's been stripped of God, essentially. Reduced to an animal. And so then the narrator serves as reason. He's trying to ration the food so they can survive for longer. He's trying to get this guy to shut up so the aliens don't find him. And then ultimately it culminates when they they witness this ultimate horror, which I don't want to spoil that horror. We'll get to that. And they don't want to alert the aliens and the curate loses his absolute mind. Starts babbling, screaming, whatever he does. 
and then the narrator kills him in a total act of survival. So they've both been reduced to their basest parts in different ways because the narrator still holds on to his rationality, but the curate has not. And so the curate does not survive, but the narrator does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of feelings about that scene where the curate dies specifically. All the characters in this kind of serve as different aspects of humanity when faced with a crisis. That was kind of my interpretation of it. And the narrator in particular, because we're with him the longest, I think he goes through a couple different ones. Like, even even at the end, you know, where it feels like he's the last man alive. And, you know, he witnessed, wit- he's in London. and Yeah, I forgot what started me on that rant. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, PTSD. PTSD, right. Yeah, that's, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> that was a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's funny, I wrote down all these quotes, but none of the specific quotes are as important as the ideas we've been talking about. Okay, so the, the quote that I wanted to read that comes before the eating humans passage, so shall I get to that quickly? Sure. I'm almost curious now if I have the same quote. <laughs> Gee, let's find out. <laughs> I marked this quote down as interest because we watched Metropolis recently. TLDR on Metropolis. There's a big metaphor for head, heart, hands, where the head in society is kind of the intellectual thinking ruling class, the hands are the working class, and the heart is the mediator between the two. That is technically a metaphorical spoiler for the entire movie, but it also tells you it within the first, like, five minutes, so... And also that movie came out in 1927. Yes. Um, Is it spoiling when the thing's almost 100 years? Yeah. So that's kind of the whole thing about Metropolis. And H.G. Wells, of Metropolis... He said it was the silliest movie he'd ever seen. And, you know, he thought it was a contrived Frankenstein ripoff. He thought it was cheesy, he didn't like it. But this paragraph that I have in my edition here is very reminiscent of that movie, so I'm going to read it now. It is worthy of remark that a certain speculative writer of quasi-scientific repute, writing long before the Martian invasion, did forecast for man a final structure not unlike the actual Martian condition. His prophecy, I remember, appeared on in November or December 1893 in a long-defunct publication, The Pall Mall Budget, and I recall a caricature of it in a pre-Martian periodical called Punch. He pointed out, writing in a foolish, facetious tone, that the perfection of mechanical appliances must ultimately supersede limbs, the perfection of chemical devices, digestion, that such organs as hair, external nose, teeth, ears, and chin were no longer essential parts of the human being, and that the tendency of natural selection would lie in the direction of their steady diminution through the coming ages. The brain alone (laughs) remained a cardinal necessity. Only one other part of the body had a strong case for survival, and that was the hand, teacher and agent of the brain. While the rest of the body dwindled, the hands would grow stronger. I mean, that's not the same idea as Metropolis, but it's just that kind of use of those parts specifically. (laughs) Yeah, like, that's the thing. It was just, it was funny to me, having just watched Metropolis and reading this, that he used a similar metaphor to get a a different message across. And I just thought that was really interesting. Especially because he didn't like Metropolis. I mean, this came out before Metropolis. Yes. But I just thought that was really interesting. I do not have that entire paragraph in my copy of the story. (laughs) No. Yeah, you don't have the paragraph after it because it's related. There is many a true word written in jest. But you didn't have that whole, uh, if I was writing a romance bit. Yeah. (laughs) So, who's winning? (laughs) But yeah, that's that's, that's not, like, super related to anything. I just thought it was an interesting kind of crossover in our world that was unintentional. A little synchronicity there. Yeah. What other points do we got? Eating people. Oh, yes. Vampires. So he determined the Martians did not have actually have mouths. Yeah, they have, like, beak things. And basically how they eat is by sucking blood out of people. Mm-hmm. Yes, which leads to the most, aside from the black smoke, this is the most horror element of the story, where they're picking people up, and he, the narrator witnesses them gathering people and putting them in a little, like, backpack cage thing on the back of the machine. And he's like, hmm, I wonder, why are they doing that? 
That's interesting. And then later we find out when him and the curate are trapped in this house, and they're trapped because one of the pod spaceship things crashes very close by, crushes half the house, so they can't leave. The aliens are, the Martians are in there building their things to go about the destruction of humanity as they do. You know, we have this whole tense scene where, you know, there's an alien exploring the house, and they have to be unseen, and they have to make their food last, and then it kind of culminates in that they find out why they're taking the humans hostage, which is right outside their little vantage point. They witness them selecting a human from their little cage backpack, and they essentially stick a straw in it and drain the human dry. You know, I don't know if I was thinking about this when I was reading this. I might have, because I had probably the same thought right now. Have you, have you ever seen Killer Clowns from Outer Space? No. In Killer Clowns from Outer Space, the Killer Clowns from Outer Space land on Earth in their, you know, giant circus tent. Mm-hmm. And they're collecting humans and putting them into a cotton candy pod, and mm-hmm. basically, they're like spiders. This sounds like a Sailor Moon villain. <laughs> <laughs> and then they... Mm, mm. No, that's, that's, I'm, I've been slowly working my way through classic horror movies, and I started with slashers, I'm kind of going backwards in time. Oh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I think it's from the 80s. Yeah, so it's probably right about next on my list, because, you know, I've watched Friday the 13th, Friday of Nightmare on Elm Street, like, I've watched all those kind of classic <laughs> slashers. I won't tell you anymore about Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll, uh... I'll put that on my watch list. I also want to watch The Blob, which I did watch once as a chi- not as a child, as like a young adult. Oh. So they eat people. Yeah, that's pretty horrible. Yeah, and I, I think that also drives home, he's had up until this point, a lot of prey metaphors. Prey is in P-R-E-Y. So, you know, he talks about at certain points, the narrator with his back to the wall, shivering violently, going underground to hide, you know, being silent, being reduced to, from essentially being the top predator on the planet to now an ant, a, a rabbit. So the fact that the aliens eat people. You know what I just thought of now? Even though there are a lot of people in the story and there's a lot of scenes like the stampede on mm-hmm. the road, everyone is very isolated from each other. People, aside from a few notable exceptions, aren't really working together. The narrator is by himself for much of the beginning of the story until he witnesses the battle in the, the river and he ends up burned. So that's where he kind of goes off and he meets the curate, but the curate's not really helpful to him at all. Like, he might as well be by himself. No, he says at one point, I should have left that effer behind. But you you feel isolated reading it. Yeah, because like even when people are together, they're not really together together. They're just like... You know, it could have been a romance. Could have. But it wasn't. Eating people, we talked about the black smoke... We did not talk about the red weed, which I think was another key point of the alien invasion. Mm, yeah, this one, the red weed was omitted from the 1950s version. It's omitted from, I think, most. Yeah. I, I say most. I've only actually seen three. <laughs> it was in one of them. Yeah, it was in the Tom Cruise 2005 it version. It was kind of a big... A plot point in that one, too, where they find out that the Martians were using human blood to, like, fertilize, fertilize the red weed, yeah. whereas in the novel, the weed spores just kind of followed the Martians to Earth, it was so kind of it spread. coincidental, like, you know, if we go for a walk in the woods, we you know come what back it and was? It, was, it was an invasive species. Yeah. An accidental invader that goes along with the people... Taking animals, plants, Mm -hmm. diseases to places where they don't belong. Yes. We have a lot of issues with invasive plants. We do. And animals, especially. Yeah. Um, Yeah, although in this story, they die out pretty quickly. Because they're not made to grow in that climate. Which is kind of ironic because we have problems with invasive species because they grow prolifically Mm -hmm. in the new climate. Well, yeah, and we have this problem as humans where we're like, we'll bring this stuff with us, and then we just, we don't think about it. Or at the time of human civilization, the knowledge wasn't there to think about it. No. Remember a few years ago when a certain cereal company was giving away plant seeds? Mm. And all of a sudden it came to everyone's attention to actually check to make sure that the plants... For the seeds were 
not list it as invasive in your state or area. Yeah. Most people didn't even think about that until it was pointed out to them because you just think, oh, well, they're just happy flowers until those happy flowers spread everywhere and push out all the native flowers. Yes. And disrupt the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We don't think about things. We don't, we don't look at things and go, there's a reason for this. And I don't mean in a religious sense. I mean in a logical sense. There's a reason that nature developed this way, you know? Anyways. <laughs> I mean, or if you want to put a religious sense to it, there's a reason why nature was made this way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, Earth's environment is the undoing. This is probably the most famous ending in all of literature. Yeah, even if you haven't read The War of the Worlds, you've seen something that used this ending. There is an entire episode of Invader Zim based purely on the ending of the story. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I don't remember it specifically. Oh, it was but... the one where, remember, Zim is watching TV and he sees a commercial for, like, a antibacterial spray. And the commercial yes. says the aliens were killed by germs. Yes. And, and he, he, yes. he becomes obsessed with killing I, every single little microorganism. I do remember that episode, <laughs> now that you mention it. Because he, think, he thinks that he hadn't survived that long on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, because, clearly, he, they didn't have that much of an effect on him. But he thought that the germs were going to kill him. I do remember that. I do remember that. It just wasn't at the forefront of my brain, because anytime anyone says Invader Zim, I think about the, the one with the, the, the organs. bodies. The organs. organs. <laughs> yeah. Dark Harvest is Dark, the name yeah. of that episode. That one sticks out the most. Well, if you are not familiar with this ending, the Martians are killed by... The Germies. The Germs, yes. Though I thought it was also interesting, because he spends a lot of time, um, especially with the curate, kind of made religion seem silly. Yeah, I feel, I also feel, I have a lot of feelings about this story, um, but I think, I don't think H.G. Wells has a strong opinion of God, or the church. But he attributed God to having saved Earth by yeah. placing the mm -hmm. viruses and bacteria yeah. upon it. So maybe it's more accurate to say H.G. Wells did not have a high opinion of established religion, the church. Because I mean, the curate is portrayed horrifically. Oh, I, I do have a quote from the curate that I wrote down. Where the curate says, why are these things permitted? What sins have we done? But yeah, the curate spends his entire time with the narrator talking about God and this, that, and the other thing. More God, salvation. And he's just kind of useless. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't do anything. He's, he doesn't help. Um, but yeah, so... One more thing I thought of we should do mm -hmm. is to rank the adaptations mm -hmm. and why they did or didn't. Okay, yes. Before we, before we conclude, let's, let's rank our adaptations. I mean, number one, I'm going to put the original work, obviously. If you haven't read this, you should read it. It's not very long. It Listen was, to the radio play. Was, I will count the radio play as an adaptation. Yeah, so our adaptations to rank are radio play, 1950s movie, Independence Day, War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise, 2005. I think that's fair. Yeah. The radio play is fantastic. It is. It really is. Incredible. Terrifying. Mm-hmm. Holds up. Yeah. There were... It legitimately scared people when it came out before they realized it was fake. Apparently, the hysteria is not was not what we think it was. Yeah, if you don't know the story around it, the, the myth is that people thought it was real and th were actually panicking and committing suicide Yeah, over it. But the radio play is phenomenal. It, yeah, it really truly is. We used to, my cousin and I used to play it. We did a haunted house for Halloween, and we, we played it a couple times. Because it's just that good. It's just so perfect. <laughs> the key point, though, is when you have the on-scene reporter he's talking, and all of a sudden it just cuts out. Yeah. Incredible. There is an homage to that in the 1950s There movie. is. So, in the 1950s movie, that was the film version that I was thinking about as I was reading it. And my dad showed me the movie back when I was, like, first or second grade. And that movie scared me. Yeah. As a kid. But I was thinking about it while I was, while I was reading the book. They covered a lot, basically all of the plot points from the novel. They were presented in a different order. And we, we didn't really stray from our main two characters at all, so. No, there was no brother, nothing. Um, and they also inserted a rom they inserted the romance in there. One of the main characters was a scientist. He was able to give us a lot of explanation yeah. In a way that was believable because he was already presented to us as an authority on the topic. Yeah, it wasn't just the, like the Tom Cruise version where you've got a, a dock worker making all these connections. And it's like, why though? 
Yeah. How do you know that? We had the that was where they introduced the shields for mm-hmm. the Martians because, like I said, they figured the weapons would be too powerful and it wouldn't be a very compelling conflict. They showed the guys trying to wave the flag when the Martians first come out, trying to welcome them yeah. and be friendly, and they immediately get blasted. Mm-hmm. They also did the electromagnetic pulse. Everyone's watches stopped. Yeah, the watches stopped. And the electricity yeah. went out. Cars still worked, though. That's true. Well, yeah, I guess they do work in the book, but also the year 1900, there there weren't a lot of cars in that book. There were trains. There were, like, trains, yeah. Well, in the, in the 50s, everyone's car, like, everyone's car breaking down wasn't a thing. Everyone's mm-hmm. car still. And then it also had the scene where, like, the, the ship lands on the house. Yes. They showed that in the Martians creeping inside the house. Mm-hmm. That's where we see them. We had the chaos scene where people are fleeing L.A., but like I said before, that was like the end of the evacuation, and it was they make a point of telling us that it was like crooks, yeah, and thieves. It was people staying behind to loot before yeah. they left? So it was already people with ill intentions to start off with who were portrayed being the ones beating each other up and fighting over vehicles and stuff like that, and everyone else had already left or was in church. Yeah. There were a lot of people in churches in that movie. That was a, a major plot point, which really, I guess, drove home the bacteria being the work of God. Yeah. Right. Also, real Marines in that movie. And then we had Marines in every movie since. Mm-hmm. They weren't actors. Yeah, because they were doing maneuvers. and. So that's the 1950s version. Yes. And then you, we, we ranked Independence Day next, mm-hmm. which it's a looser adaptation, but like I said, it still hits... All those beats. I'll be honest, I think Independence Day is my favorite adaptation. It's a fun movie. I, here's the thing about it. Okay, let me, you made the case for the 1950s version. Let me make the case for Independence Day. Okay. First of all, Will Smith. (laughs) But I think Independence Day hits all the major points of the book. And it also hits not all the major themes because it doesn't have the anti-capitalist bent and it doesn't have the anti-British imperialism bent. No, uh, it's very, it's, it's very pro-America. <laughs> it's a very pro-America movie, but it hits, I think, all the human factors, which are very important to that story, where, you know, you've got the initial humanity trying to contact, trying to be friendly, the good faith at the beginning. You have these kind of positive, optimistic portrayals of humanity where, you know, Will Smith's girlfriend is gathering survivors in the rubble of L.A., and they're helping people, and it's a genuine kind of thing. You don't really have the the greed part in that movie, like the portrayal of human greed so much. When David goes to get his father... People and, pe- and his oh, father opens people are the door and he's got with the, the shotgun. shotgun. Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, people are looting. That's, but that's, that's the only... That's it. <laughs> yeah. You have that, and you have the coming together of the military and science with Will Smith's character obviously being in the military. And you also have that, again, that element of fighting and they're not impossible to kill because Mm -hmm. Will Smith does kill one. It's difficult, but they're mortal, essentially. Um, So you have that, you have... See, now I'm just replaying the movie in my head to make sure I'm not missing anything. You do have that element of the guy trying to get to his wife, trying to find his wife, because the president and his wife are separate. So he spends the whole movie worried about his wife. And they, they do end up reunited. So that's a similar element. Um, but yeah, I think Independence Day is ultimately... First, I mean, it is very pro-America. It's called Independence Day. But it's a very optimistic movie. The the ultimate, setting aside the America yada yada, it is a movie about humanity coming together and solving a problem. The intellect, the head, and the hands coming together. <laughs> but I think my favorite part about that movie is when David, he comes up with a way to get rid of the aliens, because the aliens have this shield. Yes, just like in the 50s. Just like in the 50s, but it serves the purpose here in that, you know, none of none of our weapons can get to him. You gotta get rid of the shield first. How do we get rid of the shield? And David figures it out. And the way they do it is they give it a virus, a computer virus, which is a, I think, a very clever take on the original story of the germs. Uh, and obviously they save the day and it's a happy ending and Will Smith and his uh, girlfriend get married and it's very sweet. The one thing about the virus too is because if it's a natural virus, it's something that's out of people's control. 
Mm -hmm. So there's no point in any other adaptation of the story where humanity by itself has a chance to turn the situation around. Like, it's hopeless Mm -hmm. until this thing that happens. Until fate, God, whatever steps in. Mm -hmm. But in Independence Day, it's people who are able to change the situation. And, like, the choices of the people and the actions of the people directly. Mm -hmm. Like, David and Will Smith's character. Yeah. Being willing to help. Figuring it out Mm -hmm. and taking the action needed to save the day. Well, and also, I would also like to point out, so in... Independence Day. You could say greed is represented, partially represented by the scientist in Roswell, where because he has kind of um, Area Fifty One. Yeah, <laughs> area it's f- Roswell, New Mexico. Wa- in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. area, in area, the scientists in Area Fifty One. You know they because Will Smith ends up over there and they they drag the body of the alien he killed. Well, it was and unconscious. So, it was unconscious. And they start doing. They start trying to yeah. take it out. But of so its- the scientists in that move at Area Fifty One is very kind of callous towards human loss of human life like at one point the president i think corrects him like you're really excited about this you know how many people have died they just blew up a bunch of cities like shut up Mm -hmm. so you could you could say that he represents the greed element there greed for knowledge not material wealth Mm. but it is still setting aside human empathy for the pursuit of something you can make that argument and in fact i just did (laughs) anyways independence day is my favorite adaptation it's I know people criticize it because, like, the science... You know what? When the movie is that fun and exciting, who cares? This suspension of disbelief is there for me. I don't know enough about computers to be that critical about that part. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it works for me. But yeah, the Tom Cruise one, it had some of the elements. It had some, like, allusions and homages to, like, the original. I think because what we've talked about with the novel... And Independence Day is the the characters. Yes. The issue with the 2005 War of the Worlds is the characters. Yeah, the, they put these kids in and they just, they don't do anything for the story. We're not shown, aside from the son telling dad, his dad, you're a bad father, you're a bad father. But we don't really see... That he's a bad father? No, all we see is that he's a working class, a blue collar dock worker, and he's separated from his, I mean, we, I don't even know if we find out if they're, it's his ex-wife or they just had kids together and never got married, but like, obviously there's some sort of custody thing. So he doesn't live with his kids. We know he doesn't live with his kids. He's a blue collar guy. Baby mama and her new husband have a lot of money. That's like the family dynamic. Which is also kind of irrelevant. <laughs> a, a, it's irrelevant. B, I feel like that's just like a trope, right? Like the, the schlubby yeah. ex-husband and the rich um, whatever. We talked about how you don't have that impact when the Martians first appear. Mm-hmm. We're watching it and we discussed how the scene with the plane crash... Irrelevant. Was I think that was just straight up a bad scene. Because, yeah. first of all, there was no real emotional impact because there was no there's no people there were no people we didn't even see any casualties like there weren't anyone in the seats or anything mm-hmm. we saw like, reporters trying to steal food out of the plane and she one of the reporters just tells us oh yeah the martians have shields our weapons can't touch them they were in the ground they've been there for millennia well, why didn't you give us a scene Maybe showing us, like, some Air Force jets trying to fight these things and it's not working. Yeah. Like, and then we could have figured out, oh my goodness, it's not working. Mm-hmm. The military is cooked. Yeah, that plane scene was just... And, so, and it went on for so long. And so we got this woman telling us all the stuff that mm-hmm. doesn't really... We never saw her again. Mm-mm. We had, like, two scenes with actual, like, military action. Yeah. One of them was just to get rid of the kid for a while. The son. Yeah. It's like, we need you to be gone for the for the next scene to be tense. So, yeah. essentially, that's why and they did that. the stuff with the house. Like, the the guy in the basement was, like, the curate. And the artilleryman put together. And the artilleryman, where he had this plan about going underground. Mm-hmm. and um, But then he kind of lost his mind. Yeah, he kind of, he witnesses the aliens eat people. And use the blood as fertilizer, and then he loses his mind a little bit. And then Tom Cruise's character tells his daughter, he's like, okay, cover your eyes, sing this song to yourself. I'm gonna 
go in this room, close the door, don't worry about it. You know, it is the scene in the book where the narrator has to kill the guy, obviously, with some changes. But it, it's I was like, say, it felt more like, you know, when those, those scenes, because he, like, he hits the curate, doesn't he? He does. Like, it's an accident. It is, yeah. He means to just kind of knock him out, mm-hmm. and, and didn't then he didn't actually accident. intend to kill him. Well, yeah, well, and the thing of it is, like, he doesn't actually kill, kill him, right? He just knocks him out, and then the alien drags him off. Yeah. No, the shovel in the Tom Cruise movie was, that, that annoyed me, because the guy hits Tom Cruise's character in the head with a shovel, and Tom Cruise, like, he, he falls down, but, like, he's not, like, Oh, like, he's not holding his head, there's no bruise, there's no blood, and then he's like, okay, hold on, I'm gonna go make sure my daughter is only minorly traumatized by all this that's happening, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna kill you before you get us killed. I think that whole thing in the basement was the best part of the movie, but it was annoying. <laughs> it was kind of out of place because it was it was kind of like a horror movie in the middle of this dumb action movie. That movie portrayed the red weed. It did. Which was the only one to do so. And also the Martians sucking the blood out mm-hmm. of people. Yeah, it did have those two things. But yeah, and then the ending, which is kind of... Well, it was the same ending as usual, but without really any dramatic tension leading up to it. No, I felt nothing. Like when, you know, Tom Cruise is carrying his young daughter and he, he finds his ex-wife's house in Boston, which apparently untouched. Untouched neighborhood. But also the son, who supposedly had blown up, reappears. With absolutely no explanation to how he survived. No, the, I just... That was just, like, really conveniently getting rid of him for a while. Yeah, they literally... It's just, like, the son existed to be like, I hate you, Dad. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, it gets the scene where the military is facing off and fighting these things. And the son, for some reason, just really wants to join the military. He's like, I want to go there. I want to go there. I got to see it. I got to see it, Dad. And the dad is like, are you out of your mind? And then eventually... He has to go choose his younger daughter, and the son is just like, okay, well, I'm gonna go get myself killed. Uh, and why? They literally, they only did that. It served no purpose, no narrative purpose. The only reason it existed was so that him, Tom Cruise's character, and his daughter, Dakota Fanning, could go into the basement with the artilleryman curate guy and have a horror scene. That's the only reason that happened. Because then, with no payoff whatsoever, the son's alive! <laughs> How did he get there? What happened? Surprise! Doesn't in this matter. Totally untouched neighborhood. Yeah, it's just. With grandma, grandpa, and ex wife's new. Presumably. Yeah. And her boy her toy. New, new boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just. This, it just really. And the ending was also the same, where they died from. Yeah, they died from the germs, and then. You know, we did get one last hurrah of the, the military. Um, they realized that the shields are down because there's a bunch of carrying, like, crows circling one of the robot things and it's stumbling around. So then the military's like, we've got rocket launchers. So then we get one last action scene and then there's just a bucket of alien guts for some reason coming mm-hmm. out. And, but, and you know what I really appreciate mm-hmm. about the book is it has that whole thing where the narrator gets to London And it's like a ghost town, and he's seeing the aftermath of everyone leaving and all this stuff. And, like, dead dead animals. And then there's also, like, live animals scurrying around. And then he just sees one of the monsters just, like, frozen, stuck, and there's the birds circling it. And it's like, I think, I don't know why people aren't adapting that particular imagery. Because I think that imagery was very strong and very haunting. Of just one lone man coming up on this fallen giant being eaten by crows and stray dogs and cats. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so, that's, so my ranking of adaptations, original source material, Independence Day, radio show, 2005 Tom Cruise version, and then that I guess that TV show that I only watched one episode of. Okay. I think I would put the original to radio show. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put Independence Day next just because it's a very exciting and fun movie. Yes. And the 50s adaptation. Oh, I forgot to rank that one. Okay, which is also me. actually a good movie. It is a good movie, yeah. But just watching... Sometimes you have to just watch action. Mm-hmm. Like modern action and, you know, the pew pew. Yeah. And then 2005. Okay, okay. Just, I'm gonna redo mine because I forgot the 1950s version. <laughs> okay. Original source material, Independence Day, radio show, 1950s, and then 2005. 
This is not this is not slander against the nineteen fifties version. It is very good. I just really like Independence Day. So <laughs> Okay. Um, so that was our thesis on Yeah Were the Worlds and Were the Worlds adaptations. Clearly we had a lot to say. We did. We did. <laughs> so yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Leave your thoughts below. What's your favorite War of the Worlds adaptation? Yeah. And until next time when we discuss God knows what. Uh see you later. Bye. Bye.